good morning everyone. Welcome to Hatfield Congregational on another beautiful summer Sunday morning. We'll begin with our announcements and um, just like to mention there's a um, couple of these flyers out in that back table um, and uh, the uh, Yankee Candle employee sale is going on with 60% off, 50% off, and 30% off. It's on Thursday and Friday and so if you take this in you get those sales prices. So if you'd like to go to Yankee Candle, I just shared those with you. They said share them with as many as possible so I brought a handful for here at Hatfield Congregational. Also, I was visiting with Bernie and uh, June Lamprin, and uh, she had mentioned that this flyer is up on our bulletin board out here in the hallway, and I hadn't noticed it, so maybe I was thinking maybe you hadn't either. It's a uh, play. It's called Death and Taxes Ahead, and it's up at the Deerfield Community Center in Deerfield, Mass., and the reason that the Lamprins put this up is that I think it's their daughter-in-law is uh, one of the actresses in this play. So if you'd like more information about this, um, another flyer is posted on the bulletin board. The uh, flowers offered here are the beautiful ones that you can see quite obviously, nice and big and bushy and pink, and they are offered by Carolyn and Joseph, and they're offered in memory of Joseph's mom, so we thank them for the beautiful sanctuary flowers here. If anyone would like to offer floral arrangements to be placed in our sanctuary, sign one of our Sunday morning chat and coffees if you'd like to sign up for that, or if you'd like to let us know what one of your favorite Sunday hymns are, those are all the sign-up sheets over there. If you'd like to purchase gift cards for Stop and Shop or Big Y, Linda is right there. Um, if you'd like, and I'd like to thank everyone who helped to make yesterday's Lobster Fest, my first ever Lobster Fest, such a success. Um, and thanks to everyone who supported it by buying a ticket. Um, you know, a lot of stuff is psychological. It feels nice and cool in here today because uh, those people who are working back in that kitchen over, I don't know how many, like 12 different boiling pots of water for the uh, uh, for those lobsters, that was hot. This is, this is like uh, October right now compared to that. So to everyone who worked so hard to make yesterday's, um, you know, Lobster Fest a success, thank you. Uh, would you like to say anything else about the Lobster Fest back there, Marty? Nice. Very nice. Very, very nice. So thank you to everybody who helped raise 1400 And we left a couple of lobsters out in the sun if anybody wants those from <laughs> All right. So thank you to everyone who helped with the Lobster Fest. The Benevolence Committee will meet again after church this morning. Uh, we are going to be uh, uh, kids help. What is that? Kindness to Kids. Uh, Kindness to Kids is a fund that we've started to help uh, the kids back here at the Hatfield Elementary School who may have some financial problems getting everything that they need for school. And so if you'd like to be involved with that, if you'd like to make a donation to Kindness for Kids, um, you can talk to uh, Carolyn, you can talk to me, um, or you could come and just sit in at our meeting in the parlor after church this morning. Our Bible study group will meet tomorrow evening from 7 until 8, and we're reading from Mark's Gospel. And if uh, any of the things that you, know, you hear here kind Kind of like peak an interest, you know, please come. If you come one time and don't like it, don't ever come back. Uh, but if you come and you do like it, you find it interesting and intriguing, uh, please come join us tomorrow evening from 7 till 8. The trustees meet on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, and then I will be in Maine next weekend along with Sharon and my family. Uh, the service time remains at 9.30 a.m., and you will have Reverend Robert Livingston, whom I think a lot of you already know, um, and his dog, Daisy. And uh, Robert Livingston was one of the uh, first ministers the UCC that I met, and uh, I did the same thing as a lot of people do. I went right to Daisy the dog, and uh, he, you know, very, very graciously with a big smile on his face says, everybody says hi to the dog, and then they acknowledge me. So if you see Reverend Livingston, make sure to say hi to Reverend Livingston first, and then Daisy second. But he will be with you next Sunday at 9.30. Amen. <laughs> Amen. A.M. Are there any other announcements from the congregation? Very nice. Any other announcements from the congregation? Yes. Very congratulations to your grandson. 
it, we're going to get a lot of that noise, I think, from that truck show. So Brian Flynn just got married last Saturday, so congratulations. Any th yes? Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, it was very, very nice. All right. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, so I see none. Our guest organist this morning is Dwayne Nyman, right here at the council, and we welcome him to our church today. Dwayne is was the organist. Uh, the last one I know is at South Deerfield Congregation. I'm sure before that he he did elsewhere. Uh, the prelude is listed in your bulletin. I will not even dare to try to pronounce it. Uh, but the prelude. <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we come together right now as Hatfield Congregational Church. You are all welcome here. So I would ask you to turn to our bulletin. We'll begin with our call to worship. And as I mentioned, a beautiful summer, summer Sunday morning. Uh, 
Friday, I was working at Yankee Candle, uh, and I don't know about down here, but up in Deerfield, they had a tornado warning, so they had to take all of us um, off of the floor, the guests, the customers, the workers, all of us, and they had to stick us all in these back rooms where we have stock piled up, you know, in boxes. Uh, there were people sitting on the floor, there were babies crying and everything else, so um, another exciting day of weather, so on a day like this, uh, just a real a blessing, just a blessing. So if we could now join for our call to worship. Draw near to Christ who listens to our prayers and petitions. Come in his name who understands our needs. We open ourselves to Jesus' constant presence. Be honest before God and he will meet us wherever we need. This is why the bread of life is shared, so that we may become better people. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us now recite together our unison prayer. We hear you calling us, nourishing Savior, to a life of humility, gentleness, and patience. Keep your call before us in this hour that we may recognize and celebrate our oneness together in Christ. May God's Spirit unite us in the bond of peace. Speak to us, you who bore humanity's nature, that we may learn to bear with one another in mutual understanding. Draw us to a common faith in spite of our differences. Lead us into new paths of trust beyond our knowing and along new paths of service out distancing our own inclinations and abilities. Amen. All right, let us now raise our voices for our first congregational hymn, Red Hymnal number eight, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
that got us up and awake. So in that spirit, now we're moving and everything. Wish everyone a gift of peace. Young people, if you'd like to come forward. Time with God's children. So I heard your theme today, downstairs in Sunday school or outside, wherever you're going, is going to be games. So I talked to Mrs. Wilson and I said, what do I do for a children's sermon about games? And she said, play a game. So I hate games. What do I do? So I asked, I asked Anita and I asked my wife Sharon, and they came up with um, that game. Uh, my my little my what? How does that go? My eye is seen. I I spy with my little eye. You ever hear that game? I spy with my little eye. You have heard of it? You sure? They don't look any more excited than I do. <laughs> All right. So I spy with my little eye. What in this church has a nautical, a sailing theme? Don't look at me. Look around. Not in my shoes. What has a nautical sailing theme? Anywhere in this church, I spy with my little eye. Well, look at here's a new one. Hi, Courtney. Courtney. Courtney, you know anything about boats? You see anything? Anybody's nothing? Well, there you go. All right. Do you see any anchors? You don't even see an anchor? Oh, you know why? You can't. <laughs> hey, kids, come on over here. Go. I'm sorry. That was kind of a rigged game. Now look around. Now do you see anything that has a nautical theme? Oh, there it is. All right, an anchor. All right, so let's stay standing because maybe the other ones you won't see either. So why in the world... We're about maybe a hundred and some odd miles from the ocean. Why would our church have a picture in its window of an anchor? What, what do the anchors do for boats? They hold it in place. Anchor is a Christian symbol for faith. Faith holds us in place. And so that's not a boat symbol. That's a symbol that the ancient, ancient Christians who were fishermen and farmers, they said when we put our anchor down in, our, in, you know, in, in God, that is our faith. All right, now, still standing and looking around. All right, do you see any birds? See any birds? Oh, somebody found a bird. Okay, that's one bird. Right, and that's a pelican, okay? Now, why in the, have you ever seen a real pelican? They're not around here, right? Are pelicans around here? I don't know if I've ever seen a pelican. Now, pelicans, according to the tradition, you see the little baby pelicans up there? And see the big mama bird, the, uh, the bigger pelican? 
the tradition is, is that when things got really bad and there was no food for the babies, the mama pelican would actually take her beak and poke herself right here in the chest and she would take her own blood to feed her babies because she would sacrifice so that her babies could have some food if there was no other food. So you guys can kind of figure out how that ties in with Jesus, right? That Jesus gave up even his own blood so that we could live. So that pelican right there is a symbol of Jesus and how much he is willing to do for us. Let's sneak, let's sneak over here. Okay. All right. Any other birds? Coco. You Coco? Courtney is called Coco? Yeah. Okay. Coco. All right. Any other birds? You saw one? All right. Do you know what kind of bird that is? Any idea what kind of bird that is? How about a dove? It's a dove. Do you know any stories from your Sunday school class or any stories at all about doves in, in, in the Bible? Remember Noah's Ark? Remember Noah's Ark story? And the dove went off and the dove came back with an olive branch and then the dove took off a second time and then the dove never returned because now there was new growth, there was a new creation after the flood. So that dove symbolizes both the idea of peace and it also symbolizes the idea of a new creation. And so we got that dove there. The second time the dove appears in the Bible is in the New Testament. And when Jesus is baptized, it says that a dove comes down, the Holy Spirit comes down in the shape of a dove. So when that happens, when the Holy Spirit comes down on Jesus, that's again the idea of a new creation and peace coming to the world. So that's that symbol of a dove up there. All right, let's go sit down now. I've got to tie this up real quick. All right, we're talking later on when you guys are outside playing more games. We're going to be talking about Jesus as the bread of life. Now, obviously, Jesus is not a loaf of bread, okay? Jesus never looked like a loaf of bread. So when we talk about Jesus as the bread of life, it's taking something as simple as this, just pita bread that we can buy in a store, okay? Just like that. Or the wine or the juice that's just like this, just like, you know, you, you get in the store. And then we say that it becomes something special because when we come and we receive the bread and we take from the cup, we receive Jesus as the bread of life. So you have to be able to see things that are more than what's there. So that's that same idea of, you know, with I spy with my little eye, you have to look around and see things that maybe you missed before. Jesus as the bread of life, we have to look around and try to see things that maybe we would miss before. So Jesus is our nourishment. Jesus is our food. When we come together, we become the bread of life. Jesus is here, and we have to be able to see that. Just like we kind of looked at all these things, but maybe, maybe we never saw them before, that's what we got to do with Jesus. We've got to try to see Jesus wherever he is. Okay, guys, enjoy the rest of your games. Bye, Coco. All right. All yours, Dwayne.
It is now time for our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns, and anything else that you would like to share with the congregation. So let me begin with uh, prayers for Dave O'Massa's daughter, Lynn, um, another one in our community that is now just beginning her cancer treatment. So we offer prayers uh, for Lynn as she can, enters into those treatments. Prayers for two dear ladies also struggling with cancer and its treatments up in Deerfield. Um, so we offer prayers for Jane and for Peg. Also, Gene Sheehan is undergoing his cancer treatments. Uh, please keep him and his wife, Marcia, in your prayers as well. And again, prayers for Sue Gilman also, um, who has begun her medical treatments for her cancer. Uh, please keep her and her husband, Bill, in your prayers as they undergo um, those times of special need. Also, prayers for Glenn and Denise Wagner in their times of need and healing. And are there any other prayers that you would like to share from the congregation? Celebrations, anything. So prayers for Amy and John as John's uh, mother now is entered into a hospital and I heard hospice care as well. Anything else? Any joys? Oh, okay. Didn't hear about that. Can you offer her prayers for her? Yes. Congratulations. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep, nice to have you with us, Alyssa. And I don't know why he's worried. You got that ferocious dragon out there guarding your stuff. <laughs> uh, what a bearded dragon, and, and the, the, the bearded dragon's name is her? Yeah, 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 yeah. The girl, the girl, okay. Any other uh, prayers? Yes. And uh, prayers for our daughter Lucy. She just uh, retired with ABC in New York as a media Producer, but Beautiful. As she navigates the big city of New York. Well, congratulations to Lucy. All right. All right. Well, congratulations to Lucy. Any other prayers? Yes. The Pomeroy family. The Pomeroy family? Okay. Oops, sorry. Anything else? All right. So let us also take this opportunity of just a few moments of silence, you and Jesus, in the privacy of our own souls, to feel his prayer for us. Gracious God, from whom comes all the blessings in our lives, both the ordinary and the extraordinary, who has come to be a part of our lives in the true bread from heaven, namely Jesus Christ, your only Son, we are fed with your word and at your communion table. You are not a God who dwells far off in the distance so that we only can think what you may be. You are a Savior here among us now in this community and each of our souls made known to us by Jesus of Nazareth. It is this trust that allows us to know that our prayers to you are always, always heard. Let us now join together in reciting the Lord's Prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. From the abundance of all that God has blessed us with, and we are blessed, we have the chance to share generously if we choose. In a too often unfair and unsparing world, the church seeks to bring justice amid all of the inequalities that we see and to bring hope where there is desperation. We can do all of these things in Christ, but it also requires our help, our contributions. We need to put into action our belief in the food that endures for eternal life that is so much more nourishing than the manna that this world offers. So in that spirit, let us be as charitable as we possibly can. Accept, O Lord, these are gifts that we now will place in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and also for each other. Use these gifts to your purpose and offer your blessings to all who have been generous this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our next chance to raise our voices to God in praise is Red Hymnal number 287, Hear, O Lord. Thank you.
11, verse 26, through chapter 12, verse 13. And if you want to read along, it can be found on page 248 in your Bible. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and wore him son. But the thing that David had done was So the church in the summertime is just loading up <laughs> one really pleasant story after another one. And uh, well, sure makes a preacher's job a little bit difficult. So let's move on to a very pleasant story. Uh, the pleasant one is in John's Gospel, chapter 6, verses 24 to 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So, as I alluded to, through the middle part of this summer, and I don't know who came up with this reading list for the middle part of summer, but I owe him a great big thank you or her, um, they've really asked us to consider stories of, just in the past few weeks, of beheading, of holy war, of rape, and of murder. Now today, we could follow that up with a sermon based on the prophet Nathan's rebuke, his brazen rebuke of the king established by God. It was a man's world 3,000 years ago. Bathsheba's emotions, Bathsheba's pain, Bathsheba's situation where after her husband is murdered by this guy is now brought in to be his wife, none of that is really considered in the Bible. It's really not considered all that important. Women just did not matter. Think about the nice thing that they said about the ewe lamb or the poor man in Nathan's remarks. He, the, the, the animal, the pet, was like a daughter uh, to him. Women just did not count as much as men back then, and this is why Nathan hammers home the wrong that David did to Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, instead of talking at all about Bathsheba. Uriah was a mercenary. He was a hired soldier. He was a Hittite. That means he didn't even have a country. The Hittites were over like where modern-day Turkey is. He's now in Jerusalem. He has no homeland. He doesn't have any children, according to the story. All he has in his whole life is his wife Bathsheba. David, on the other hand, has a palace, has riches, has power, and he's got a harem. He's got a harem full of women. Uriah was a mercenary, so he's got nothing. David has got everything. And David sees no wrong in what he has done in raping the wife and murdering the husband because he is the king, and the king can do whatever the king wants to do. And it's a man's world 3,000 years ago, and David is the big man. So Nathan, he's close to David, but even God's prophet can't approach the king and call him out to his face. So Nathan has to trick David into convicting himself. The prophet tells that story of the rich man who steals the poor man's one ewe lamb. The lamb was more a pet than an animal, it says. The rich man is greedy to the point of really becoming just a caricature. When the king hears of the obscenity of this man's callousness, he says that the man must die because of his complete lack of pity. I have all of these herds, I have all of these flocks, I have all of this stuff. That guy has got one little ewe lamb. A guest arrives at my house. I'm not going to take from what I have. I'm going to steal his one ewe lamb. And David is furious. And this is when God's prophet holds up that proverbial mirror and he unleashes that scathing judgment right to the face of the king. And the prophet says to King David, you are that man. David must have been staggered by this unexpected turning of the tables. David had become much impressed with himself. The king doesn't have to answer to anyone about anything. But David forgot that God is not much impressed by human titles and human power, that God, our God, cared as much about Uriah, and God cared just as much as about that woman Bathsheba as he ever did about David the great king. You are the man could have been the basis for a sermon not only about old King David, but about that lasting message of God who speaks unexpectedly to any person and to all people who fail to recognize the equal worth of others. Anybody who thinks that I am more, impor more important than the other person just does not understand the message of our God. They don't understand that anybody who would try to grow even richer, even though they've got abundance of stuff, would try to grow even richer by taking what little someone else has. They simply do not understand the message of our God, Old Testament and New Testament both. They do not understand our God. Now this isn't a message about mercy and compassion. It's not a message about giving to the poor. This is not a charity message. The man who owned the one ewe lamb wasn't asking for anything. He wasn't expecting any hands out, handouts. Think about Uriah. He wasn't asking for anything. All he wanted to do was fight David's wars and just come home to be with his wife Bathsheba. Wasn't asking for anything. So this isn't a story about a wealthy man not giving a little something of all of his flocks and all of his herds just to help his neighbor. This is a story of a heartless man who has more than enough 
but who still feels compelled to take what little the poor man has so that he can be even richer. We live in a world today, right now, where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And this isn't a debate about how to fix it or if it needs to be fixed. This isn't a conservative liberal debate. This is just a fact of the numbers. The rich are getting more, the poor are getting less and less. And I would hate to think that the condemnation that God spoke to the prophet Nathan, that he would still need to speak it again to us today. But it's simply too much. It's too much to have these messages week after week after week after week. When you choose to be here in the summer on a beautiful day like this, it's just too much. So instead, after stories of beheadings and holy war and rape and murder and greed, we have to move on. So let's talk instead about today's gospel. Let's talk about Jesus' revelation of himself. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And he complained to the people who were looking for him. He says, you're only coming after me because you had your fill of loaves. They had a full meal. They had a delicious lobster dinner provided by Jesus. And Jesus said, you're only coming to me because I fed you. That's no reason to come to me. You've got to look beyond the obvious. Like I tried to tell the children, you've got to see the unseen. You have to open up your eyes to see how God is around us in ways that we simply pass by too often. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. doesn't mean that you'll never be hungry and thirsty for this, the body. It means that your soul will be taken care of. Now, bread was the staple of life in Jesus' day. Ordinary people, they didn't eat meat on a regular basis. They just couldn't afford it. Passover lamb, that was a once-a-year celebration. So if they couldn't afford it, bread was the thing that sustained them. It was both ordinary in that it was available, but it was also extraordinary because it was life-giving. And this is what Jesus uses as an example to explain himself. Of all the things that Jesus could use to explain himself, he said, I am the bread of life. I am ordinary. Look at me. I've got dirty feet in my sandals. Look at me. I sweat when it gets hot. Look at me. I get hungry. I get thirsty. I get angry. Look at me how ordinary I am, and yet I'm extraordinary. And think about that in a little while when we come forward to be in communion with each other. Ordinary and extraordinary. I am the bread of life. You know, this past week, Sharon and I, we took off for a couple of days to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and York, Maine. It was a real strange beach vacation for us because I don't think it's Sharon, I think it's me. When I go out, like for a beach vacation, God laughs. And I'm not used to worrying about sunburn when I go to the beach. I'm worried about tracking hurricanes, where they come, because whenever I go to the beach, it's miserable weather. But this time I went, and it was two beautiful days. But even with that great weather, on our way home on Tuesday, we still had to make a point of stopping off in Kittery at the When Pigs Fly Bakery. I don't know if you've ever been to When Pigs Fly Bakery or bought a loaf or two around here. I love When Pigs Fly Bakery breads. So we have to, even on a beautiful day, go through Kittery with all of those shoppers and all of those, oh my God, those stores. Got to go through all of that to get to the Kittery Bakery, and we do. And no matter when you go there, it's always crowded. You know, sometimes bread is a necessity. It's just something that holds your sandwich together. You don't even take notice of the bread. It's there just so your hands don't get all gross. But these breads, oh, these breads, they make you drive out of your way just to get a loaf or two or three. Now Jesus, the bread of life, is like that. He's worth going out of our way. He nourishes us spiritually. He sustains us spiritually. He also excites our spiritual taste buds. When you can really receive Jesus in communion, when you feel the communion of this congregation, it's a wonderful feeling. It's an exciting feeling. It's, a, it's an uplifting feeling, and it's something that touches God. It's ordinary, and it's extraordinary. When you get your little piece of bread, when you get your little cup of wine or juice, take a look at it. It's the same thing you buy in the supermarket. It's ordinary, but it's extraordinary. We gather around the communion table as equals. Take that, King David. We're all equals at God's table. All are welcome. None are ever turned away. And the bread of life nourishes us so that we don't reserve it only for the saintly, only for the holy, only the ones who pass our muster and say, oh yeah, you're holy enough to come to see Jesus. We share it with those who needed to be strengthened even more than the saints. And this doesn't diminish the holiness of what we are going to do. Rather, it continues the holy work of Jesus, who came to be in communion with all people. 
Jesus didn't protect his holiness by staying away from sinners, by staying away from people that were outcasts, by staying away from people who were different and pushed away by society. Jesus came especially for them, it says. The ones who were hurting and the ones who had fallen into sin, those were all in communion with Jesus. Contrast that image of the man Jesus, the bread of life, shared with any and all with Nathan's condemnation of David as you are the man because he was just like that pitiless man who butchered the poor man's one you lamb. We face repeatedly choices between communion, community, and selfishness that I'm more important than somebody else of respecting the value of others or the inability to see others in the eyes of God as important as I am. Whether you're in a palace or whether you're living in a tent, God loves us all, one and all the same. The bread of life that we will share together helps us to make the right choices in life. So let us now come together at this Holy Communion table, invited there by Jesus himself to help us become more like Jesus himself, to feed on the bread of life, to strengthen the bonds of our shared community as the one equal people of God. In his name we pray. Amen. I do believe in your bulletins that you have a handout as well inside. You don't have them in there? I think there are some more, if you don't, on the uh, back table, if you didn't get one in your bulletin. And you're invited to uh, follow along and respond in the bold face print. This table is for all Christians who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of all God's people. The Gospel tells us that on the first day of the week, Jesus was raised from death, appeared to Mary Magdalene, on the same day sat at the table with two disciples, and was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. Women and men, youth and children, gather round Christ's table. For this table is for all people who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for the beauty and the bounty of the earth and for the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us. With your daughters and sons of faith, in all times and all places, we praise you with joy. Holy, holy, holy God of love, majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory. O God Most High, blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. We remember that on the night of his betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to the disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the bread. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the cup. May we now join together in reciting the prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of our Savior's presence and the simplicity and splendor of this holy meal. Unite us with all who are fed by Christ's body and blood, who may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, amen. All right, let us join together. Blue 436, shalom, peace to you. We'll go through it twice.
So I, uh, I think I got carried away with the children's uh, time, and so I'm going to make this as brief as possible, move right into our benediction response. Christ, the bread of life, now sends us out to feed others. Whoever comes to Christ will not be hungry or thirsty. Join together with the saints in upbuilding the body of Christ. Seek to equip others for the work of ministry in Jesus' name. May the Spirit go forth with us and dwell with us always. Receive with joy the salvation Christ offers every day to everyone. Let us better appreciate that we are healed even as we serve. So let us move out into the world nourished by the bread of life. And I'd just like to say one more thanks to Dwayne, who was here at our console today. Thank you very much for your gift of music. And uh, next week, I won't be here, but Anthony will be back with Reverend Livingston. Thank you. Yeah.